so good day class so today we're going to have our lecture on domes okay so i think domes are interesting topic uh, in alternative construction systems because you uh, you would barely encounter uh, throughout your uh, career that uh, there's a requirement for a dome okay, so i think that's um, what makes it interesting and and also some of our books in uh, history has featured a lot of classical designs uh, using domes okay so let's uh, head on to our uh, lecture so domes are prominent features of persian roman byzantine Islamic and Italian Renaissance design. So the building construction handbook describes domes as double curvature shells which can be rotationally formed by any curved geometrical plane figure rotating about a central vertical axis. So in its simplest form, a dome is a hollow hemispherical structural element. Then domes evolve from arches so, originally being adapted only to small buildings such as huts and tombs. Let me just have a volume a bit. Okay, so, however, as construction and design techniques developed, uh, they became more popular as a means of showcasing grand structures such as cathedrals, legislative buildings, and more recently, leisure buildings such as sports stadia. So, domes became famous because they are self-supporting structures. So these are the elements of a dome class. Uh, first is the cupola. You have the coffers. It uh, may not be there in all. Then you have the lantern. Uh, I think not all the domes have this. You have the oculus. Okay, the, those who will remember your history of architecture. So do you still remember? You can find the oculus, the dependentive, the rotunda, the squinch, and the drum. Okay, so this is the drum. This is the dome. So the lantern. This is the pendentive, okay? And the squinch arches. So a copula class like like this one is a small structure located on top of a building's dome. It's a common for copulas to have a round or square bases, but they may also be polygonal. Modern copulas are mostly ornamental architectural features crowning the main roof, sometimes providing a position for a flag religious symbol, weather vane, and so on. Okay. It's also a daylighting element. Okay. So here's the lantern. So it would allow the light to get inside. Okay, so this is an oculus. So Latin means oculus or eye. It's a circular opening in the center of a dome. Okay, and these are the coffers. So a coffer is a series of sunken panels the shape of a square, rectangle, or octagon in a ceiling, soffit, or vault. Structurally, it lightens the ceiling as less concrete or other materials are needed for its construction. Then we have here the pendentive. So a pendentive is a constructive device permitting the placing of a circular dome over a square room or an elliptical dome over a rectangular room. Okay, so these are examples of the pendentives. You can see here this is the dome. In a rotunda is any building with a circular ground plan and sometimes covered by a dome. Then you also have what you call a squinch. So a squinch is a wedge that fits on the top corners of a square space. So this is your oculus, this is the dome, this is the drum, the dentives, the dome on pendentives. And this is a dome on squinches. So the square is the dome, this is the drum, this is the squinch here. So Another is a drum. So a tholobate or drum is the upright part of a building on which a dome is raised. It is generally in the shape of a cylinder or polygonal prism. Okay. Here glass what you call a drum. So the materials for domes is that sometimes it made of it's made up of brick, concrete, metal, prefabricated sheets, or even bamboo also be made of timber 
cast iron or glass. So I think uh, the details you can find this in our uh, history of architecture uh, books or even in, in time saver standards or I think um, DK Ching uh, books have a lot of details on domes. Okay. You can find these details on the DK Ching uh, book. So there's a uh, different types of domes. You have the corbel, the cross arch, the geodesic the onion, the oval, the saucer, and the umbrella. We also have what you call corbel domes. So also called a beehive dome or false dome. So these are different from a true dome in that they consist of purely horizontal layers. As the layers get higher, each is slightly cantilevered or corbel toward the center until meeting the top. Okay, so this is constructed in this way. Also have what you call a geodesic dome. So a geodesic dome is a hemispherical thin shell structure based on a geodesic polyhedron. So the triangular elements of the dome are structurally rigid and distribute the structural stress throughout the structure, making geodesic domes able to withstand very heavy loads for their size. So a geodes geometric dome supports itself without needing internal columns or interior load-bearing walls. This property makes such structures appealing for use as churches, sports arenas, and exhibition halls. So, geodesic domes are efficient structures in several ways. So, the triangle is a very stable shape. For example, a force applied to the corner of a rectangle can't deform it into a parallelogram, but the same force will not deform a triangle. This makes geodesic dome buildings highly resistant to such forces such as snow coverings, earthquakes, wind, and even tornadoes. So geodesic domes can be constructed quickly without heavy equipment. So this is an example of that. Another example of geodesic domes. You can see there's a lot of triangles. Okay, so movable structures may be built of polyvinyl chloride, uh, pipe or galvanized steel conduit frames covered with plastic sheeting or parachute canopies. Large permanent structures like arenas and factories have been built for materials like aluminum and steel frame struts covered with aluminum, copper, structural gypsum, or acrylic. So geodesic domes insulate very efficiently and because of its unique shape, light actually refracts and stays inside the dome longer than other types of greenhouses. This feature amplifies winter lighting and also takes full advantage of solar gain, which means less artificial lighting in colder regions. And you also have the crossed arch dome. So rather than meeting in the center of the dome, the ribs characteristically intersect one another off center, forming an empty polygonal space in the center. So geometry is the key element of the designs with the octagon being perhaps the most popular shape used. However, the arches are structural or purely decorative remains a matter of debate. So this is an example of the classic roast arch dome. Then you have also the onion domes. So these domes are characterized by the way they bulge out beyond their base diameters and taper smoothly in an ogee or S-curve profile. So their height usually exceeds their width they're often gilded or brightly painted. So these are traditionally associated with Russian architecture, or in particular, their multi-dome churches. Then we also have called the oval domes. An oval dome is a dome of oval shape in plan, profile, or both. Also a saucer dome, like this one. So a dome having the form a segment of a sphere the center well below the springing line or a shallow dome. Then we have what you call an umbrella dome. So it's your type of dome divided at the base into curved segments which follow the curve of the elevation. The ribs of the dome are radial lines of masonry that extend from the crown down to the springing. So these are the advantages and disadvantages. So, the advantage of dome is that it's high on visual impact and in most cases is both uh, strong and durable. Whereas less maintenance, having a dome-shaped structure 
integrated with the foundation, the floor works to strengthen the entire structure as a unit and therefore makes the dome highly resistant to earthquake damage. A sphere encloses the greatest volume for the least surface area. The disadvantage is that it requires skilled labor. Then it requires more scaffolding, then it requires more material, so more volume. So it takes more time for heating and cooling. Okay, so I think it's an example of the world's largest dome. Okay, so thank you. Uh, okay, so this is the end of the PowerPoint uh, uh, for the different types of domes. We will continue class on the lecture and how domes are built. Okay, so just wait a sec. Okay, class, so let's continue our lecture with our uh, monolithic dome construction process. I think that's a short uh, video on uh, the new construction methodologies for building domes. As you can see class, there is a lot of potential uh, the use of domes. I think because of its uh, uh, form itself, because it's more fluid and it's more organic, okay, then you get to save a lot of space. Okay, so let's look into another uh, video on the dome construction process. Hey class, so this is another video on how to construct a monolithic dome. So let's watch it together. And basically, uh, that field was the, the, the field in which they trained. Uh, that, that field in Haiti. Um, they, uh, we had two guys come with us from Port-au-Prince who uh, um, definitely had a, a, a wider skill set than uh, the guys uh, down in Manish. 
Um, there are some classes um, there, but not much else. I mean, you have to understand that when we are, we arrived on the site, um, you know, um, we got together a crew of people to start working. Um, there wasn't a pencil on the site. There wasn't a, a single hand tool. Uh, there wasn't a screwdriver. Uh, no one had uh, a knife. No one had uh, anything. Um, and so, um, even finding a compressor turned into a real nightmare. I passed on what little knowledge I'd gained uh, to them, and they, being very smart guys, figured out the best way to, to use it with a, with a bit of instruction, and I set about putting a thin layer of um, essentially shock cream on, on the outside of the air force. You know, I said to Nolan that we encountered many problems down there and many failures um, in equipment, and not one of them happened with his equipment that he sent me. So um, it's a sort of rare honor, really, that, that nothing, that, that, you know, from all to sprayer, you know, fails. Everything else fails because that's the nature of the beast down there. We were using a lot of cement in our mix because of thin shell. Um, and I guess I can't quite remember how much water we're putting in, just enough to get it through, uh, to mix it. We, we, we actually got hold of a, well, everything you buy in Haiti, the first break. Um, so obviously the first cement mixer we bought broke. And the second cement mixer, a brand new sort of $3,000 machine that we got in Port-au-Prince, you know, was mi missing nuts and bolts. Um, because that's how it is. And um, but we mixed it up in a cement mixer. Um, they could have mixed it by hand, but I wanted it to be a little bit more consistent than a mix. So we bought a cement mixer, and they would um, put it into a wheelbarrow and run it round to where the guys with the uh, mortar sprayer were, and he would dunk it in the wheelbarrow and chuck it on the airport. Obviously his equipment worked very well. The guys using it understood it really quickly, got a feel for it really quickly, you know, um, uh, found the maximum way, you know, the, max, the best kind of way to use it. Um, as, as people who build do, they find the easiest way to do something pretty quickly. And, um, you know, I intend to use it you know, on any eco shell building projects um, that I'm involved in. Okay, so I think this is a good example class of uh, the struggles that are going to meet when you're building a dome with limited technology and materials. Um, that is why class uh, it's really um, important for you to understand that there are some things that are quite easy to design on paper for example their domes but implementing them and constructing them is a different matter okay. so you must not only be good in drawing you must also understand how to construct your ideas so that's why I'm showing you uh, uh, I showed you those, those videos but you can think about it ahead of time okay so I think this ends our lecture for uh, weeks 5 and 6 uh, yeah weeks 5 and 6 so I lessened some of our activities um, so that just to give you enough time to do your plates on your other subjects also okay so uh, I hope you're doing fine class in this pandemic then just keep on thinking past think positive then don't forget about your dreams of becoming an architect someday so you're near the finish line already a couple more years you graduate then two more years of apprenticeship become architects
Okay, so I hope uh, you're going fine. See you next uh, uh, meeting. And if you have any further questions or clarifications, that's, you can always reach me anytime. And we can always arrange a uh, synchronous meeting for any questions or concerns. Okay.